Hey guys, Nyanachi here. Uh, I'm just here at the beginning of the video to tell you that um, this video is largely the same as last year's video. I just wanted to update it and add new content to it. If you would like to just skip to the new content, you're totally welcome to. Um, I'll get into the reasoning why I decided to redo this video, um, but it was mainly new content. But I'll get into the reasoning at the end of the video. Warning. This video does contain very minor spoilers for both Shimeji Simulation and Girls Last Tour. I say very minor, please don't get turned away. I try to keep this as spoiler free as possible. I will let you know if there are major spoilers in a part, which there is at one part of this video, and I will give you a timestamp to skip over it. Thank you so much for 12k views on the first video. I really appreciate it. Please enjoy. As of recent, the anime industry has seen a repetitiveness and staleness that has only now begun to push for more quality in the recent years. Isekai being a prime example of a genre that has been overdone to death already, with rom-coms coming close behind in that respect. Although that being said, amongst all the copy-paste content I've witnessed in the market today, there are still undeniably gems out there. There are reasons people rave about shows like Konosuba or Bunny Girl Senpai, as they take the initial stale genre and run with it as far as they can. New twists on classic stories, character tropes ironed out, and plots fleshed out with an identity of their own. I'm not saying that all isekai or rom-coms are bad, but more so that they have become much less interesting at this point. I could name countless examples of content breaking the mold, but that's a video for another day. My point is that there is always more to explore in a genre, no matter how boring, repetitive, and overdone it can be. And the same goes for Slice of Life. Hello all internet weebs, incels, shut-in neats, and hikikomoris of the like, my name is Nyanachi, and today I'll be taking a dive into the most bizarre manga I've ever read. When I think of expanding upon a genre, my mind instantly takes me to Suku Mizu, or TK Miz as it's often abbreviated as. Let's flash back to the year 2014, because a new mangaka is about to have their work published. TK Miz, a somewhat mysterious mangaka with only an alias to identify them, takes the industry for a spin with their genre-melding post-apocalyptic slice-of-life tale about two young girls. That is... quite the mouthful. I'm talking, of course, about Shoujo Shumatsu Ryoko, better known as Girls Last Tour in America. It's shameful for me to say this, but the manga is untouched territory for me as I haven't yet read it myself. Is what I said a year ago. Yes, I finally read the manga. The manga of Girls Last Tour offers so much more while still being every bit as brilliant as the anime adaptation was when I first watched it. The plotline follows two girls, Chito and Yuri, trying to find their place as the world they've come to know is slowly crumbling around them. Literally. Yet, instead of focusing on the sad, cruel, and downright terrifying fate that these two experience, Girls Last Tour instead chooses to focus on their daily life and the struggles that face them. In an empty, lifeless world full of ambient scenery, TK Miz manages to fill that lifeless void with just two characters. And by focusing on only two characters, their character growth and your personal attachment to them can really be developed within just 12 episodes, or 47 chapters. From wandering around in the snow, looking for shelter, to swimming with literally the last fish left alive, the moments these girls go through are like nothing I've seen from a traditional slice of life. Without spoiling too much, I'll leave it at this. Slice of life is the main focus, but ounces of darker undertones are sprinkled in throughout the experience that remind you these two girls have no purpose past this journey. The limited supplies and short stamina of Chito and Yuri become much more apparent as time slips by. Where the anime leaves off, the universe of Girls Last Tour is just reaching its peak. Where the manga picks up from there, in volumes 5 and 6, especially in volume 6, the fantasy element is torn away from you. As if the journey and experiences of these girls wasn't relatable enough to begin with, your sympathy begins to project out onto the protagonists as their storybook comes to a close. Whether it's a happy, sad, somber, thrilling, quiet, peaceful, or terrifying end is up for you to decide. 
But regardless of how you feel about it, the end is certainly incredibly realistic. Girl's Last Tour is a work of surrealism, fantasy, and relatable humanization that is timeless and wonderful in its own special way. The anime and manga are both simply spectacular, and Girl's Last Tour is one of my personal favorites, so much so that I actually own it in my physical library. Twice, because I'm crazy like that. For a genre that's experienced its fair share of comedy-driven, colorful, kawaii experiences, this one show feels quite distant. But as bizarre and out of place as Girl's Last Tour is, it is by far the most bizarre work TK Miz has written. Right? Well... Let us flash forward to the year 2019. 365 plus days have passed since Girl's Last Tour has ended, and left the community with a hole in their weeb-shaped hearts that needs fulfillment. TK Miz is hard at work creating a much more surreal and psychedelic experience that puts the imagery of Girl Last Tour to shame. I may be exaggerating a bit here, but believe me when I say one of the tags for this manga is WTF am I reading. Shimeji Simulation is something special. Much like its predecessor, the manga only focuses on two characters, but much unlike its predecessor, the manga is grounded in a traditional, non-post-apocalyptic high school environment. Akin to any other school setting slice of life, this work kicks off with the two main characters meeting each other for the first time. Shijima Tsukushima, the lonely shut-in hikikimori with mushrooms growing on her head who spent the last few years living out of an apartment closet, and Majime Yamashita, the mysterious energetic blonde born with a fried egg on her head. Uh, I'm not kidding. Shijima's personality gives off the vibe of carelessness and is a much more antisocial, closed off girl when you first meet her, while Majime is the complete opposite. Majime is always trying to chime in during outside conversations, attempting to meet new people, and putting a positive spin on Shijima's attitude. The banter between these two is nothing short of entertaining and charming, giving us a glimpse of a much more familiar, carefree childhood experience that many of us look back upon fondly. Hold on, let's take a step back. Something is already out of place. I'm sure you guys have questions such as, why do these characters have objects on their heads, and why does it not phase them? Well, this is just the beginning, as it only takes a few chapters before the situation Shijima and Majime find themselves in get incredibly odd and unexplainable. The story kicks off in the early chapters of the manga, with the two first years being required to join a club. Not wanting to do so, they reluctantly look at the club listings, only to find that there's a hole digging club. What kind of a school hosts a hole digging club? This one, apparently. The club seems to switch every year. First it's a hole digging club, then it's a hole filling club, and so on and so forth. Probably the oddest part of the club though isn't that it even exists, but that the teacher running it, Miss Mogawa, seemingly becomes obsessed with digging. Miss Mogawa is a more grounded, laid-back type of teacher with a very glaring alcohol problem. You also have other interesting side characters, which include the likes of Shijima's science-obsessed sister, the gardener, or that weird girl with the stick, as I like to call her, and Chito and Yuri who make occasional appearances. Throughout the story, Shijima's sister, who she calls Big Sis, spends her time investigating seemingly meaningless science that would not make sense in our own universe. And in the beginning, you truly believe her antics are just a gag. But after an experiment of hers sends our main characters into a realistic, dreamlike landscape, you begin to understand that the world you've seen up until this point is only just a glimpse of what it has in store. Each chapter brings you a new, unexplainable situation that is only grounded by the idea that this universe has its own laws that are very different from our own. But there's really no need for an explanation, plot dump, or recap to make sure you understand what's going on, because what is shown to you already gives you a good idea of what the world is like. I really appreciate a more visually focused story for a change. The setting these characters find themselves in is nothing but extraordinary, and they aren't afraid to address it themselves. From a chapter that has Shijima gaining an extra mushroom and becoming telepathic on a rainy day, to the school flipping sideways but keeping the same gravity, everyone in the story does actually find the happenings odd. And although they aren't blissfully unaware, they do tend to just play along with what's in store. 
It snows in summer, how about we dig out a cave and make a hot pot? Water is no longer obeying gravity. Let's play with it while we have the chance. Each chapter is so entertaining because you want to see what the two girls will make out of the twisted reality they inhabit. I found myself more often than not going back and staring at pages just to take in the scenery. So here are some of my favorites to give you an idea of what I mean. The four interconnected telephone poles. The cat-shaped rock. All the donut-shaped objects Miss Mogawa makes. The giant food that Chijima dreams about. The floating water pool. Alligator. And of course, Yoshika the fish-shaped pencil case. TK Miz really likes fish if you couldn't tell. Like, a lot. And, and looking back, there was a good chunk of fish imagery in Girls Last Tour, but Shimeji definitely pushed the fish imagery to a whole other level. No two panels are the same, and even though so many landscapes feel out of place, they also feel like they fit in perfectly within this intriguingly crafted environment. As far as story goes, the basic structure is the same as most slice of life. Follow the main characters and their daily life experiences and see what they get into. However, I feel like TK Miz puts a bigger emphasis on the story than it may at first seem. Although, please understand that most of this is just speculation on my part. I mentioned earlier that Chijima's sister is studying science. That science is a major driving force of the weird happenings in the story. Shijima's sister begins to learn the out-of-ordinary properties of the universe and apply them in situations. For example, she tapes two fish together that always flip to one side, causing them to indefinitely spin, and then makes a perpetual motion machine out of it. The machine is then used to dig an enormous hole. While not a single lick of logic is present in the design, it works because Big Sis harnesses the laws of the Shimeji simulation universe, therefore allowing the impossible to become possible. The few bits of dialogue Big Sis has had throughout the story indicate that she knows something is coming, or something bigger is at play. You do gradually start to notice a shift between the early simple chapters and the later practically brain-melting pages of confusion as well. However, there isn't much driving force behind a tense, engaging, ever-growing story. The main attraction is what happens to the characters in the moment, rather than where they're headed next. And I believe a grand story is less important when the growth and experiences lie within the expertly written characters and the environment they play with. You want to see how Shijima and Maji may develop, where they go, and what they make out of this vast, unexplainable landscape that surrounds them. That's where I feel the story really shines. That is, until around chapter 30. It is incredibly difficult to emphasize my feelings and thoughts regarding the current events in Shimeji Simulation without leaking massive spoilers, but I will keep as much out of this video as I can to still keep the series enjoyable if you have yet to read it. The story has now flip-flopped and become entirely more important than it was only a year ago. Ten more chapters have dropped since I created my video last year, and within just the first four of those, the plot thickens immensely. I mentioned earlier that Big Sis may know something is coming or something bigger is at play. Well, it turns out I was right, although I was slightly off. Big Sis had a larger influence on what was coming than I initially thought. There is something messing with the structure of West Yomogi and you learn what that something is during chapters 28 through 30. Chapter 29 discusses the properties of West Yomogi through a conversation with Big Sis. Chapter 30 then executes what many of us believe to be the climax of the story. Take my word for it when I say no one was expecting this incident to happen, because the buildup is very subtle. TK Miz does a brilliant job dropping hints with the cryptic statements from Big Sis and giving us important imagery scattered throughout the manga since chapter 1. Mainly the giant stones that have been an object of mention on a number of occasions by the main cast. Just when you think the manga was at its bizarrest with the floating water pool and the objects manifesting through thoughts, it flips you on your head and dunks you in a pool of the most oddball experiences you can't begin to imagine. Don't believe me? How about the new city hall? This dude riding an alligator, a literal zombie apocalypse, a speedy corn cob, the miniature town, and my personal favorite, 
the end of monetary economics. Everything you thought you knew about Shimeji Simulation was only just scratching the surface of what was to come in the latter chapters of this glorious graphic novel. Back when Chapter 30 dropped, I was actually concerned that we may have been close to the end of Shimeji Simulation. Rest assured though that I now believe that not to be the case. TK Miz didn't just push the story closer to the end, they left it open for more diverse, expansive, and imaginative chapters. Almost like an awakening of sorts, the main cast now have the ability to control crucial aspects of the world around them. There is no telling what is to come in the future, but I can now confidently say that the story is of ample relevance to what was once just a bizarre slice of life. Something that caught my eye upon a second read of the manga was Shijima's role in the overarching narrative. Shimeji Simulation had always felt written from a third-person perspective, as if you were gazing upon the events like some distant bystander. However, if you focus your gaze on the text boxes strewn throughout the chapters, it becomes quite noticeable that this isn't the case. Shimeji Simulation has a narrator. Inner monologues have been present in the works of TK Miz since Girls Last Tour, as seen with either Chito or Yuri, but direct narration always seemed to be absent. Contrast that with Shimeji Simulation, where Shijima reflects upon entire chapters worth of content, and drops her remarks right before the next chapter picks up. I can't say for sure when these bits of narration take place, but it seems to me Shijima is reflecting on the past from some point in the future. Whether that point is after the story ends, or at the end of the day that was the setting of the chapter narrated upon, is still unclear. While the perspective of Shimeji Simulation is still somewhat third person, there also seems to be an interpretation there to digest from our main protagonist. What's most intriguing to me though is why Shijima was chosen and not Majime. Of course you have the blatantly obvious scientist sister who is a humongous driving force in the story, and Chapter 1 started following Shijima so obviously it would continue to follow her. And although those points are valid, I feel like the selection of the narrator has more to do with the mindset of the character and her personality. Shijima is closeted, quite literally at the beginning, but more importantly she is unwaveringly indifferent towards her surroundings, gaining the perspective of an introvert in a setting that constantly throws her otherworldly externalities has quite an intriguing effect. Let's take for example, the end of chapter 17. The movie that Shijima and Majime watch is quite literally a simulation. The characters are trapped in the world of a TV set. Shijima reflects that if her world was something like a TV show, she honestly probably wouldn't do anything about it. However, if Majime was only playing the role of a friend, she would be heartbroken. Not that the spectacle surrounding her really bothers Shijima, but losing what matters to her definitely would. The statement is honestly quite surprising, as it took 10 chapters in the first place before the two girls officially became friends. Occasionally the narration does switch to Majime, but these moments are few and far between. Like at the end of chapter 22, Majime dreams that she is Shijima. She's alone in a cramped space, and although she feels pain from loneliness, she is also fine staying the way she is. Although it's Majime bearing the weight of the dream, all the emotions she feels as Shijima come off as genuine. It seems as though the underlying emotions Shijima carries are buried deep within her, and while she's indifferent to the change occurring around her, she can't bear to change who she is. Portraying themes through Shijima as a narrator is a brilliant tactic to bring unnoticed tones and philosophies into the narrative. Moreover, the perspectives Shijima shares on other characters and situations lead to a more relatable character altogether. It doesn't matter if you don't act the way Shijima does, most of us can sympathize with the way she sees the world. I'm taking a shot in the dark here, but I wouldn't be surprised if Shijima is somewhat of a self-insert of TK Miz themselves. We still know next to nothing about TK Miz behind the alias, but their Twitter profile somewhat resonates similar energy. The thoughts of Shijima could just be thoughts that TK Miz has on a daily basis that they decide to focus on in a chapter of their work. It would be akin to an afterwards note from the author. Many light novels and manga traditionally have those. I know Nisio Isin writes those a lot. Aside from the narrator, the heavy themes TK Miz weaves throughout the story were also much more noticeable to me this time around. While everything is left to audience interpretation, there are many themes that are quite evidently portrayed by much of the colorful cast of the Shimeji Simulation manga. Shijima is indifferent towards change, and Majime is embraceful towards it. Big Sis is a catalyst for freedom, and the Gardener is a defender of structure. Miss Mogawa is stubborn and struggles with addiction and purpose, and Sumida is shy and unwilling to speak what's on her mind. 
Whether the meaning, personality, actions, or purpose of a character is important depends on how you, the audience, take in the contents of the manga. After all, it's just a slice of life. That being said, it is undeniable that the way characters are written produces diverse perspectives on the perplexing experiences delivered to them. By observing the happenings of the world, you begin to understand those who inhabit it just a bit better. Well, here we are. I was going to leave the video off at that last section, but after rereading and understanding the most confusing section of the manga, only a tiny bit better, I've come up with a theory. So now is the only point in the video I will tell new viewers to get out. I'm going to be delving straight into unfiltered spoiler territory, and this manga is far too interesting to not read blind. Skip to this time slot for the conclusion. There's your warning, spoilers in 3, 2, 1. So here's a little background on the properties of the Shimeji Simulation universe if it was too difficult to take in from what Big Sis describes. From what I understand, the cause of the odd circumstances in West Yomogi, pre-chapter 30 events, or pre-world break as I'll call it, is a culmination of diverse dreams that people in the town had. Dreams that not only were incredibly bizarre, but also leaked outside of their own space, creating the dream stones that we frequently see across multiple chapters. For future reference, I will refer to this phenomenon as Dream Leak. While the experiments of Big Sis also cause multiple events, it is important to note that the gardener even says, things like this happen sometimes, even without anything like that, referring to the experiments. Inhabitants cause most of the mistakes of the town. We also know that all the way back in Chapter 9, it took raw fish to even share dreams with other people. So post-World Break is basically the same world we'd seen this entire time, but everyone can now share their dreams to manifest whatever they imagine. Which is all fine and dandy, but that doesn't explain how Dream Leak was possible in the first place. If you have a regular world with the properties of our current world, there is no way events like the ones in West Yomogi could take place. And before I get comments about how this is a work of fiction, you have to remember that the West Yomogi inhabitants also believe events caused by Dream Leak are incredibly abnormal. Which means the properties of the Shimeji Simulation universe should have always been plenty close to what ours are like in real life. But they're not. So if dreams shouldn't be able to leak into real life, how is it happening? Well, they can't leak into real life, but it's shown that they can leak into other dreams. For some rapid fire examples, in chapter 6, Shijima unknowingly invades the dream of her big sis, and then in chapter 10, both Shijima, Majime, and big sis share one dream. So here's what I believe is happening. Everybody is trapped in one big dream. One big dream that is dreamt by Shijima. I know, it sounds insane, but hear me out on this. Let's start with the events in chapter 30. Right while the world is restructuring, we get flashbacks of when Shijima and Big Sis were little. Neither girls seem to be proficient at fitting in, and it seems Shijima was following the same fate as her sister, except this time, her Big Sis was there for support. As Shijima cries in the sand pit, Big Sis says something pretty significant. I don't think this town is for us. But don't worry, one day, we'll have more freedom. Almost as if she knew the events to transpire, she talks of freedom. There isn't a plan quite set in place, but that statement is enough evidence to show Big Sis had initiative to find more freedom. A big sister would be willing to do anything for her little sister, especially if she knew the same pain. The idea that Shijima created a world where she could live happily without being shunned was probably not something she thought of on her own. After all, we know how unmotivated and indifferent Shijima acts. Rather, I believe that Big Sis found a way to harness the power of dreams, and used Shijima as a subject because she knew Shijima would create a world where she fit in. Then, after finding a way to enter Shijima's dream, she would trap people there before entering herself. Upon entering, though, Big Sis lost her memory, something she didn't account for. Losing her memory makes sense if you take her line from Chapter 30 as early planning for the world break. If she found a way to gain more freedom, she would obviously work towards that goal. Yet she does experiments to determine the properties of the world for many chapters before the world break, which isn't indicative of someone who already knows how to obtain freedom. 
She was unable to inform inhabitants that they could manipulate the surroundings, and she no longer knew herself, therefore, dream leak naturally occurred and people were confused. Giving everyone freedom was always part of the plan, but Big Sis had to start from square one because she had no recollection of her initial plan. If you think about this theory, a lot of aspects of Shimeji simulation start to make sense, such as the landscape of the city. West Yomogi is pretty plain as far as cities go, something Shijima would naturally think up. Big Sis calls the city a calculation, meaning it would be deliberately and neatly designed a specific way by a particular person. The Donji is empty because there aren't enough inhabitants trapped in the dream to come close to filling it. The imagery and properties of the world also start to make sense. Jijima's attachment to fish is evident within the properties and functions of the world. Landscapes get twisted and messed up easily, probably unconsciously. No one can die in the world because accidents and deaths never happen. Almost everyone is given some odd quirk, like the headwear, to make Shijima stand out less. What I'm saying is definitely far-fetched, but I don't deem it out of reach for Shimeji simulation. However, there are a few inconsistencies that this theory has. Mainly, the gardener, who is still an unknown entity who most likely carries information still not given to us. She is also potentially some sort of god, but we don't really know that yet. And then there's the city itself, which seems to have a boundary now. The void is obviously space that West Yomogi inhabitants have yet to modify, but it only manifested after the world break. Prior to the world break, there were neighboring cities, mainly the one with the mall from chapter 17. If West Yomogi is Shijima's dream, I have a hard time believing she can imagine neighboring cities prior to the world break when the citizens can't imagine them once the world breaks. Chances are my theory isn't close to true, but there's no denying that we've gotten to the simulation part of Shimeji simulation. Whatever the case, it's clear that the ultimate goal of Big Sis is to create a much more passive world. One where sadness doesn't exist, diversity isn't an issue, and freedom to create is boundless. What struck me the most in chapter 30 was the page where Big Sis and Shijima are sitting on the steps of a massive ancient Greek-like structure. Shijima asks Big Sis, will sadness be a thing of the past? due to the world she created. To which Big Sis responds in a very Tsukushima fashion, I'm sure sad things will still happen. I think. You could see this statement as pessimistic, but it really is only a natural response. Sadness is a natural part of human life, and bearing the weight of it can sometimes lead to happiness in the future. Making her sister happy is what she desires, but uncertainty of whether it will even happen is still there. After all, who's to make decisions for other people in regards to their own happiness? I feel the beauty in this piece lies within the idea that nothing is elaborated upon. Explanation isn't always something an audience needs when they can observe and discover one for themselves. Even when explanation is given, it just makes enough sense to still not make sense while also making sense. Does that make sense? The visuals and experiences of Shimeji Simulation reflect upon where our brains wander when we're daydreaming, sleeping, or maybe tripping on ghost fish. The manga encapsulates a universe encased in a bubble where the impossible is possible, the unlikely is likely, and the illogical is logical. What TK Miz was writing a year ago is vastly different from what they're writing now, yet at the same time, it is very much the same. What seemed like a climax and potentially a lead-up to closure to the story was actually a brilliant development creating a gateway to much more intriguing possibilities. Rather than Shijima and Majime being handed odd scenarios, they can now be the ones creating those said scenarios. Although it is still a slice of life, Shimeji Simulation may have gained a greater philosophical meaning than what was just once an oddball slice of life. There is a complex beauty in the boundaryless reality of Shimeji Simulation that perfectly contrasts the simple beauty of the grounded reality depicted in Girls Last Tour. Whether TK Miz deliberately decided to write the two stories with opposing structures is beyond me, but regardless, that's how it turned out. Shimeji Simulation is truly something special, and I certainly enjoyed reading it and rereading it quite a bit. The manga is ongoing and currently has 36 chapters in total, 10 more than last year. It is released monthly through Media Factory's Comic Kune magazine. I think I pronounced that right this time. So if you live in Japan, you could probably pick it up. If you are at all interested in Slice of Life, trippy visuals, or are familiar with TK Miz's other works, I cannot recommend this manga enough. 
I would tell you where to find the English translation, but unfortunately there is currently no official English localization. To avoid exposing the lovely people who do God's illegal work, I cannot tell you where to find the fan translation either. Although I think anyone with a keyboard and a mouse wouldn't have a hard time finding it. For something that I stumbled upon by chance, it has quickly become one of my favorite reads of the last two years. Plus, who doesn't love Bunny Girl Majime? Hey guys, uh, end credits, Nyanachi here. Um, this is all unscripted, so there's gonna be a lot of ums in this. So the reason I redid this video is not because I'm disappointed in the initial product. That has nothing to do with why I wanted to retackle this project in a new way. It's more so to celebrate this video being one year old, and also my channel being one year old. Because this video kind of kicked off everything. But aside from that, there were issues with the first video that I really wanted to address, mainly the export of the video. I don't know if any of you have worked with Premiere extensively, but there's like a bajillion different sequence setting options, and I chose the wrong one. I did not choose something that was 1920 by 1080 so that video could only be exported in an incredibly small video size, and it just looked terrible. I'm even surprised people got the algorithm going on that because I just didn't think anybody would want to watch that kind of quality of a video. Um, I am going to upload an HD version of the original video, um, redone as much as I could. Um, some things might be off because I was, this was like pre-editing before I recorded audio for this version of the video, but the video is pretty much the same as the original, just in HD. I'll upload an unlisted version of that and I'll leave that in the description if I really butchered anything in this version. Um, but again, I also wanted to re-record audio because my microphone at the time was absolute shit and I believe that this one does the video more justice. Um, aside from that, I wanted to try and leave everything pretty much the same as it was before, so I hope I didn't butcher anything, and I wanted to make corrections to the things that I messed up before, like the pronunciation of TK Miz's name, um, and the pronunciation of the magazine, um, and I also wanted to talk about Girls Last Tour. So that's ultimately why I decided to remake this video. It gives you guys new content, um, I'm not doing this again in the future though. If I talk about Shimeji Simulation again, I will make an entirely different video. I'm not going to go back and redo this video a third time. There's no reason to, because all the problems that were in the original I fixed, um, and I updated things. So you guys get 36 chapters of content in this video instead of the 26 last year before everything big happens. Um, but yeah, so... Check the description, there'll be an unlisted version of the HD version of the original video if you guys really hate this version, or if you just want to check it out, because it's nice seeing all the visuals in HD. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that, so thank you so much for watching, thank you for so much of the support on the original video, and I'll be back with a new video next month, hopefully, that I teased in my last video, so go check out details on there. I saw you guys pausing, I can see those analytics in my little analytic thingy on YouTube. So, um, yeah, go check, go, go, go check that out. You'll see what my next video is. It's pretty, pretty obvious to find in that video. Anyway, leaving it here. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. My name is Nyanachi. This is the longest end slate I've ever made. Bye-bye.